Hey folks, um, this was uh, entirely impromptu. I, uh, you know, I had some GitHub notifications I wanted to get to over the weekend, and I figured if I'm going to be doing open source programming anyway, why not stream it? And if anyone thinks it might be interesting, they can watch it. And for people who don't care, they can just not watch it, and it's fine. Either way, it costs me very little. Uh, uh, in this case, I have like I think I. Have about two pages of GitHub notifications to get through. I have no idea how far we're going to get. I'm not, you know, I'm not aiming to get through all of them today necessarily, but I figured, you know, there's, there's a quite a variety of issues and PRs to look at here. So I'll just, you know, sort of start from the back and move forward. Um, if you've watched the previous one of these streams uh, where I do open source development, you'll see that you'll recognize some of these notifications as things that I skipped last time. Uh, and I am also going to skip them this time. Um, I think this one is probably the first one I haven't really looked at in a while. Um, so this is a PR I filed to Rust itself to make it so that the ARCH64 build of the Rust tool chain builds LVM with support for compression. Um, it's a good question. Why did this get stuck? I got stuck because we need libz for ARCH64 because I think it gets cross compiled. Uh, I don't think I want to pick up the context for that here. I think the fix here is actually pretty simple, but there's a lot to catch up on. So I'm going to mark that as unread and come back to it later. The current starting experience is not user friendly. This is, they're totally right. Like, the so this is for a crate called tracing timing. Uh, tracing timing is a, a subscriber for the tracing crate. That um, so tracing lets you emit you know events. Think of it as you can do logging, except it's more structured and it doesn't have to just be logs. It could be you know metrics, any kind of observability event that you want for the execution of your program, uh, and then. Tracing sort of separates the things that produce the events and the things that consume or subscribe to the events. Um, and in this case, tracing timing is a subscriber to events. It consumes events from tracing. And in particular, what it does is it looks at the time between each event. Uh, and then it keeps a histogram of where you end up spending most of your time. So this can be useful for tracking down, um, you know, let's say that you have a, a request handling function or something and it has a bunch of steps you can use this to figure out which steps are taking the longest across many requests um it's a little fiddly to set up uh and you know that they quote from the docs here of the docs basically saying you're sort of on your own here um this is mostly a documentation problem although Part of the complication here stems from the fact that it does concurrent recording. And it tr like if you have multiple requests, it tries to not, you know, do any synchronization between the requests because that would make logging these events slow. And instead, it, it puts it on the consumer of the library to sort of say, now I want to gather the data from all the different threads that might have been uh, gathering histogram data. Uh, and that makes the API a little awkward. But it is also, it also lets the subscriber implementation be a lot more performant. Um, documenting this is fairly tricky. It's also not a crate that I actively use anymore, not because it's not useful, but because I don't really write software that needs this particular functionality uh, these days, right? Like I use this a lot for for Noria for trying to figure out, you know, when, when a particular, you know, read or write request to the database is being processed, where does that time go? and Subsequently, you have, where can I shave it off? Where are there weird distributions where some part of the code is usually fast, but sometimes has, you know, um, large peaks. You can look for like bimodal distributions, for example, in your histograms. But these days, because I work more on build tools, that doesn't come up quite as much. Um, so here, I'm going to mark this as unread too. There's a, a lot of context to bring back in. And I don't think it'd be very useful to see me remember how this works and write up a bunch of docs. Um, I, so someone's asking in chat for, you know, if they were to contribute to tracing timing, where would you start? Um, I think this is a great place to start. Like, I think the, the documentation for tracing timing isn't awful, uh, as in, 
you know, it, it does document how to use it, what its output looked like, uh, how to extract the histograms, how it interacts with, with the subscribers. So it's not as though this crate has no documentation. It's more that the, as, as the issue says, the, the starting experience here is, is kind of painful um, because there are so many knobs that you sort of need to get right. Um, and part of this might be just putting in more examples to the crate for like, this is how you set it up. This is how you run it. Um, and I would be totally happy for someone to just like to contribute to those. In fact, this is a crate that I would be happy to basically give away. I, I don't have a strong need to, to own it myself. And, you know, in general, giving away open source projects is a, a little weird because I don't want to just give it away wholesale to the, the first person who comes along. Um, I, I want to sort of mentor them into it a little bit, shepherd them into it. And then, you know, when they've demonstrated that they have the, the know-how to responsibly take care of the crate going forward, then, you know, I, I would happily hand over the reins. Um, and then the same is true for, for timing. So I think if someone wanted to contribute to this, um, you, you start by making the, you start by tackling a problem that is not, you know, about fixing the low level bugs in the code or anything like that, but, but more things like the getting starting experience or the API or the documentation, like start there and then work your way into the, the technical details. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to take PRs on, on any frontier, really. It, you don't really need to, you know, focus on a particular thing to be able to get your PR in. Whatever PR you think would be useful to contribute, I would be happy to take a look at. And, you know, the open issues are always a good place to start. Um, all right, Mark is on red. Uh, that brings us back to here. Uh, so you'll notice some of my notifications here are um, un they're red, but they are not marked as done. Usually these are things where there's no more action necessarily from my side in terms of that issue or PR, but there's some separate follow-up work I need to do. So in the case of this uh, crates index diff, for example, um, this is a bug in creates index diff that, or not a bug, let's call it a missing configuration flag that I would like to get added. And it's work that I should do at some point and contribute a PR. Um, and, you know, th there's no rush to do so. It's just, it, think of it as sort of a, a very low priority to-do list. Arguably, I should just like bookmark it for later, but I never look at my bookmarks. Um, or this one, when multi-line pasting and tmux new lines are stripped. This is a bug that I occasionally run into on my work machine when SSHing to other machines and running uh, vim in tmux. Um, and it's this is more of a reminder or an easy way for me to find back to the issue. If I find it again, I want to share some more information about the context in which it happens, but there's nothing for me to actively do about it. Um, Sharded counter optimization. Let's go look at this. So this is in Flurry. Um, so Flurry, if you remember, is our port of the Java concurrent hash map to Rust. Um, the work here is one of the to-dos that we left when doing that porting was that the concurrent histogram has a, a counter, an atomic counter, that's used to keep track of how many elements are in the map because you you don't want to count them just like by walking the whole map because that's going to be really slow. Um, but if you keep a single atomic integer, that's also not great because all, that means all axes that update the map um, have to contend on this one integer value. Some of them are going to increase it, some of them de decrease it. And, you know, computers can be fairly efficient about doing those kind of uh, counter updates. But even so, especially once you get to like, you know, multi-socket architectures like NUMA nodes and such, that doesn't really scale. Um, and so one of the optimizations that's in the Java concurrent hash map is they use effectively a sharded counter. So rather than having one counter that all the threads update, um, you keep some larger number of counters um, and how you choose and, and which one you choose to update um, can vary. And then you have readers read all of those counter and sum them. Uh, the idea here being that writes no, now only contend with other, or updates only contend with other updates that access 
the same shard of the counter um, and readers just do reads. So, so they, they um, parallelize really well. They don't need to take an exclusive lock on the, the underlying memory location. Um, and so this is someone who, well, so th there used to be this PR which was looking to add um, shared counters. And there was a lot of great work there. Um, and they posted a bunch of benchmarks. Let me see if I can find these, um, which actually, it was a little unclear what the win was. Uh, but in some cases, you can see here, for example, um, So with, this is with eight cores using the, the shared counter versus just a single atomic counter. And you can see that it, it ends up running faster or more operations per second um, than the equivalent atomic counter. And if you have fewer threads, um, it doesn't really give a speed up, which also, also makes sense. Um, and then ultimately, uh, because they ended up moving away from the the implementation that was in this PR, they opened a second PR and closed the first one um, that has these um, other op operations instead. And part of the thing I asked for in this PR was for the logic to keep this sharded counter to be extracted into a separate crate. Um, and so they did that in the form of this uh, fast counter crate, which is again, using a, a basic sharded concurrent counter. Um, now the question is, where did I leave this off? Right, so so this is one of the things that's that's complicated about being, um, you know, being a maintainer and asking for, basically asking for another dependency is, you don't have to audit that dependency, right? It in many cases is not feasible to do a full review of all of your dependencies in practice. Like I just don't have the time, but in this case, this is you know, pulling out a fairly performance critical part of Flurry, uh, the, the counter that is. And I wanna make sure that the underlying implementation we're swapping it out with is actually a sensible one. Um, so in this case, uh, you know, I, I basically, the, the PR here, you'll, you'll see if I look at the diff, is actually fairly straightforward. So it takes a dependency on fast counter um, with some features, and then it replaces the counter that we have in Flurry with a concurrent counter instead of um, the atomic eye size we previously used. Um, it creates a new one where the number of shards is the number of CPUs. This is a pretty common way of sharding. It doesn't have to be this way. You can also do things like shard by CPU socket or by, um, you know, by NUMA node or something. That makes the, the operation for choosing which counter to update a little more complicated um, than, than if it's just the number of CPUs and you can just use the current CPU's ID as the, the index into the list of shards, for example. Um, but number of CPUs is fine here because this is one per map. Generally, we're not going to be very concerned about the memory use of, you know, let's say you have a, let's say you have 200 cores, right? Then this is 200 times the size of an integer. That's how many counters you're going to keep for one map. It's not great, right? But also 200 cores is a lot of cores and the memory here is probably not really that bad. Um, uh, it makes a note about, this is probably for the, yeah, this is for the length operation on the map. It just adds a note, which is something I requested that the read you do uh, might not, ref might be, uh, you know, in some sense different from the truth. When you have a concurrent map, there are going to be updates continuously at the same time as you're calling length. So what is the true length really if you read in the middle of multiple updates. And so really what this is saying is um, that in the absence of concurrent updates, you get inaccurate results, but concurrent updates that occur while the sum is being calculated might not be incorporated. So basically this is sort of a, an approximate read of the number of, um, of items in the map. And you see that this just calls the, the sum method on the concurrent counter uh, rather than loading the, the single counter that we had before. Um, Yeah, so here I made the optimization that previously we had a, an optimization where, uh, so you can do multi-updates in the map. You can do things like uh, add multiple items, remove and add an item, or just replace an item in place. And in those in the cases where the, the length of the map doesn't actually change, you don't need to do any atomic operation. 
uh, and this is the example here, right? If we compare the, um, the delta of the count to the previous count, uh, sorry, to, to zero. And if they're equal, if it's equal to zero, then we just load the counter. We don't actually update it. Uh, and this is an optimization that I said I wanted us to keep. Um, the other observation I made here is that um, the count, we want to make sure it takes an I size rather than an U size. Um, or rather, actually, that's not quite accurate. I want the counter that internally in the library that we're using to hold U sizes rather than I sizes because counts are always positive. But I wanted to be able to add I sizes, right? Because if you have a, a number that's a count, you want to be able to subtract from that number. And in fact, that's what we did here, right? Count used to be an atomic U size. And so what that meant is if the I size was negative, we would have to call a different method with the positive value to subtract. Um, but this has the, the benefit of you can technically store a larger count, you know, by a power of two because you don't need to store the sign. Practice this doesn't really matter. You're not going to get to a count that's like two to the power of 64 anyway. Um, and we'll see. So it looks like they actually made a change here. I haven't had a look at what that was. Um... Removes on NSC unsafe. Okay, so you see the change is actually super simple here, but that's because all of the complexity of that sharding is being moved into this um, this fast counter crate. Um, so let's see what the updates were since last time. So you see, I posted this August 20th. They got back to me August 21st, and it's now October 8th. I apologize, Jack Thompson. Um, Right, so I made some other observations that um, one is to remove the need for an unsafe cell. They kept a thread local to keep track of the current thread ID. Um, and they used an unsafe cell to be able to modify that thread local. And instead, you could use a cell, which allows you to mutate through a shared reference, as long as you're not sharing the cell amongst multiple threads, which you don't because it's a thread local. So it's guaranteed to not be shared. Um, on nightly, as yes, I made the observation that on nightly, you don't actually need to use this thread local at all because you can just use the thread ID from the standard library, which has a as u64, just lets you get the the an identifier for the current thread anyway. Um, sorry, by a factor of two, not a power of two. You're entirely right. Um, And the other was, why do you even need nightly here? Can't you just do this all on stable? And I think they used nightly because on nightly there's a, you can do thread locals without pulling in an external dependency. Or rather, it's not even that. It's uh, you can do it without a macro. There's a macro in the standard library called thread local. And on nightly, you can use an, an attribute thread local instead, just on a static variable. Um, that win didn't really seem worth it to me if that's all we're doing in order to get, um, like if if it's really just a syntactic thing, it doesn't seem very worthwhile. Uh, but they're saying originally the performance difference was greater. I guess we'll see how that um, came back. September 7th, been looking into this and a few thoughts and findings. Uh, thread ID as U64 proved to be significantly slower Oh, interesting. I wonder why. What does thread ID as U64 do? It just reads self.0. That's interesting. Oh, I'm guessing they call thread ID new. Yeah, what they're probably doing is, um, uh, so there's a, there's a thread current that gives you one of these thread objects and you can call, uh, you can call ID on it to get the thread ID and then you call as U64 on it to get the, the U64. Um, I'm guessing that they're actually not storing the thread 
or either that or dot id is slow self dot inner oh yeah inner is an arc so maybe they store the thread rather than the thread id that's my guess because then you do have to go through an arc which is a, a pointer indirection it shouldn't really matter that much it's a pretty simple pointer chase um That's interesting. Two to three X slower. Uh, eventually showed the counter being slower than a regular atomic U size on every core count. Uh, so a cell for a thread local, that's real weird because a cell in Rust is just a repro transparent over an unsafe cell. And when you call set on a cell, it's the same as a self.replace. And a self dot replace is just a mem replace of an unsafe get. So something's real weird. Like a cell is just an unsafe cell. Interesting. It made it slower than a regular atomic U size. That's wild. Um, uh, okay, so this is a good point, this last one, which is. Um, uh, let me make this a little bigger so it's easier to read. Um, so this last one is interesting. The observation here is that I think the way this is set up is that um, every time you you modify the counter, you actually, instead of trying to figure out like which thread am I on or which CPU am I on and then updating the, the appropriate counter, um, you pick randomly or actually maybe it, it uses a thread id i'm guessing given the the code here but imagine that w when you when you remove an item you're not necessarily on the same thread that added the item right so imagine let's say that you know all the threads happen to choose the same counter every time so that one keeps incrementing and it's basically the value of that is the size of the map and then some thread comes along and tries to do a delete. So it deletes a thing from the map and it starts to decrement a counter. But it decides to decrement a different counter than the one that everyone has happened to be using so far, which is fine because it's the sharded counter. But that other counter is zero. So it can't decrement that counter and it doesn't know which counter has all the values. Um, and so if you make all of them eye sizes, you don't have to deal with this problem because the sum across all of them is going to be fine anyway. So you can just decrement and make it minus one and it's fine for one counter to be that. Um, that's interesting. Okay. Ugh. Sometimes the GitHub quote thing is real weird. Let's try that again. Quote reply. All right. I'm always torn on whether to apologize for giving slow replies because on the one hand, I don't really have anything to apologize for. All of this is a volunteer work anyway. But on the other, like they did the did a thing and wrote up about a thing and I didn't get back to them for, you know, a month. Uh, and that's not, I don't feel good about that. So I'm, I'm torn, um, but I don't know. Maybe I'm too nice, but I like it. Um, Let's see. So here, I think what I want to do is, um, how about we say, uh, looking at the stood source, um, it seems like the arc is in the thread type, whereas the thread ID type is um, just a plain integer. I'm guessing this ends up being a, uh, this ends up slow because you're uh, either 
calling thread current on every access, which is slow, or um, or keeping the thread around, which means going through th the arc each time to get to the uh, numeric ID. Um, I think the way to fix this is to um, store the thread ID in a th in a thread local. Uh, that way you should have super cheap access to it. Uh, thread, is it thread ID or no lowercase d, okay. Uh, as u64 is just a field access. Without having to keep an ID counter yourself. Let's see. Um, producing cell over unsafe cell. Super weird. The code for cell is really just an unsafe cell with wrapper transparent. And cell set just does mem replace unsafe zero. Uh, which should cost as much, uh, cost exactly as much as just setting the value. And certainly not as much as running atomic operations. Um, hmm. Uh, could you give the raw numbers you observed to see if we can figure out what's going on? Oh yeah, so this is about removing nightly. Nice. That's enough there. Um... Uh, and a totally valid reason for using an eye size uh, for the sharded counter. I think I'd still prefer for the API to return a U size because the sum should never be negative. Um, though maybe we, sh uh, which I think we can simply assert with a debug assert. So it doesn't affect release performance. Uh, release build performance. Um, it's fine to make add take an eye size though, I think, since um, it's a little weird but not the end of the world. Great. Oh, did I typo? I probably typoed. Where did I typo? 
Sharded? Did I typo sharded somewhere? Sharded? Uh, I don't see my typo. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, let's see, what are people saying in chat? Uh, not sure I like it passing in CPU count when creating the counter versus later use of add, which doesn't take in a thread ID. Um, well, so, so I would think of number of shards is, the, so the argument to new is the number of shards you want. And it doesn't have to be the number of CPUs. Uh, just like if the, I think, um, if I remember correctly, the internals of the library is um, it uses the thread ID modulo the number of shards to figure out which um, shard to update. And so I don't think it makes sense for add to, you know, take an argument. Although, you know, there's a decent argument for shared counter. It doesn't say shared counter anywhere. There's no shared counter. Um, it, it might make sense to have a, you know, an additional uh, mechanism for saying, I want to do this add on this particular counter, but I think that's rarer to be used in practice. Uh, In what kind of project do you need such a library? It's super interesting, but I work in web, so I can't imagine what to use it for. Um, actually, in web development, it comes up quite a lot. Not necessarily needing a shared counter, but you do need a shared map quite often, right? So imagine things like, um, uh, imagine you want to keep a cache in your, so you have your little web server running, um, and you know there are all of your different request handlers get to run in parallel. And let's say that they, they want to cache some, some stuff in memory to make it faster to access. Well, now you want to share state using a key in memory between threads, which is what a concurrent hash map is for. Um, and if you are going to be doing that, then you want that shared hash map to be as fast as possible and work as well in parallel as possible. And if ultimately your shared map works really well in parallel, except for the counter, which ends up being centralized and contended on, then that's ultimately, it's going to end up being a, a sort of performance bottom, like especially as you start scaling to very large uh, number of cores. And so that's why you care about this. So you as a you know individual web developer might not use the sharded counter library directly, but you're decently likely to use something like a... Uh, like a concurrent hash map or use some like, let's say web framework that provides caching for you by using a concurrent hash map internally, right? The alternative would be you keep like a mutex of a regular hash map, but that means that every request handler you have, they're all going to serialize on access to the cache, which you'd probably rather avoid. Um, is there actually a case where a sharded counter would be a negative number? Um... It's a good question. For a sharded counter, um, the question is more about the algorithm that runs the sharded counter. Could it ever, because of all the concurrent accesses, could it ever be that um, a decrement happens before the increment that it's supposed to have incremented? And in general, that shouldn't be true. Um, right, because at least the, well, for counters, actually, it's weird because counters are usually updated lazily because they're not, they don't need to be perfect. And so usually, you know, the, the concurrent algorithm you're using tends to have these mechanisms that ensure that you can never remove something until it's been added, right? That, that shouldn't be possible. Um, there has to be some kind of, you know, in, in a map, it's often by key where access to a given key is going to be sequential. So you can't have it be removed before it's inserted. Um, but for the counter operations, maybe, um, in which case maybe there's an argument for it's possible for for a brief period of time a counter to actually be negative, right? So imagine that, um, imagine you, init you start out with an empty map, um, one thread does an insert, um, another thread does a read, and a remove, um, and 
the two race, so the insert code runs, and it runs all the way up to where it increments the counter. And if you assume that the counter increment happens at the very last outside of any other synchronization, then the insert hasn't returned yet. But the value is still observable in the map. And then a read runs, it finds the thing that was inserted, and a remove runs to remove that value, and the remove runs to completion before this thread gets to continue, so that includes the decrement. And so there's a brief period of time after that remove finishes, but before the insert finishes, where the total set of the counter is actually negative. That's a good point. Um, I think you're entirely right. Uh, on second thought, in a concurrent setting with lazily updated counters, it's entirely possible that a counter ends, that the sum of the counters ends up being negative for some period, shorter period of time. So I think we should actually leave the return value as an I size. Um, Uh, someone's asking why thread ID modulo CPU count. It's not modulo CPU count. It's modulo the number of shards. The idea being that you want, in general, you want different threads to access different shards, but you might have many more threads than you have CPUs or certainly than you have shards. In fact, for, for something like this, it's not obvious that you should choose number of CPUs as the number of shards. As I said, one example is you could choose the number of NUMA core, NUMA sockets, for example, or you could just choose like three, right? Th just three is going to cut your contention by a third, assuming the distribution of the thread IDs is, is roughly uniform in terms of their access. And like, you know, there's a big question here of what is the right number to choose. Uh, and it partially depends on your algorithm for choosing which shard to use on access. Um, you don't have to use thread ID. You can pick randomly, um, although generating a random number is also takes a bunch of cycles, right? You want, because reads might have to access this, but even for writes, you want generating the index to be relatively cheap as well and certainly not require any synchronization, which is why like the thread ID, if you have it in a thread local anyway, is a pretty cheap way to do it. Another is choose randomly, although then you have to generate a random number. Um, but you might get more uniform access over time. Um, another is use the CPU ID modulo the number of shards you have, um, right? And, and if the number of shards is the number of CPUs, you're guaranteed to not contend with other CPUs. Um, but getting the CPU ID is actually fairly costly. Uh, not to mention you might be rescheduled between when you check your CPU ID and when you access the shard. So it's not perfect that either, um, even just because of things like interrupt. So it's actually a fairly tricky game that you're trying to play here. Um, but, but you can choose anything. Like you can choose, you know, you're in, a, in a, an asynchronous concurrent execution context. You might choose like the task ID or something. That works fine too. It's just you want something that is fairly likely to give somewhat uniform of an access pattern or distribution across shards rather. Um, okay. Uh, so I think we're now done with that one. And, you know, with my luck, they're going to respond before I even finish the stream. Uh, Okay, so this is a thing in Cargo. Um, so Cargo recently landed the ability to pass additional configuration op options using cargo dash dash config. Uh, and you can give here, you don't have to give a file name, you can give either a file name, in which, car, in which case Cargo is gonna read that file as a Cargo configuration file and merge it with whatever configuration applies to the build. Or you can give, you know, dash dash config build.target equals, like a, a single TOML uh, key value pair. Um, and this is convenient for just, you know, ad hoc configuration where you don't necessarily want to change your entire cargo config. You just want to change something for this run. Um, 
If both an environment variable and that are specified at the same time, the environment variable overrides the file passed in over the CLI. This is counterintuitive, and also the documentation is unclear about this. Right, so the documentation claims that configuration values specified this here, meaning with dash dash config, uh, take precedence over environment variables. And so this is just wrong. And I guess the steps are gonna demonstrate this. So in the cargo file, we're gonna do, Ha, huh. so this is actually, the steps here are problematic for a different reason, but let me talk through it first. So the idea here is you set an environment variable that tries to specify this value. This is a neat trick to know about. Um, for With Cargo, you can set basically any configuration option using an environment variable just by turning it in all uppercase, turn every dot into an underscore and prefix it with Cargo underscore. So Cargo underscore build underscore target underscore dir is gonna set the build dot target dir configuration value in cargo. Um, and then cargo build dash dash config dot cargo slash foo dot toml. Oh, actually, ignore me. I was going to say that this is, cargo is going to automatically load this file as well, which gets weird, but it doesn't because this is called foo dot toml. So the observation here is that one configuration file is passed in here, or one, one value set for this flag is passed in here, a different one is passed in here. And based on the documentation, it's supposed to prefer this value because it was passed with dash dash config. Um, but instead, uh, the build happens in from env rather than from futomal, which suggests that this value is preferred. Um, and I agree, this is straight up incorrect. Uh, I'm being cc'd because I landed, I stabilized dash dash config in the first place. As is, or I didn't implement all of dash dash config, but I, I helped stabilize it. Um, and yeah, that's interesting. So actually the reason why this happens um, is somewhat interesting. Let me see if I can't explain what's going on here. Um, so in cargo, uh, there's a bunch of stuff that parses configuration files. Uh, what specifically was this called? This was called load file. Uh, load values unmerged. Unmerged. Load values unmerged. Okay, what calls this? Uh... Yeah, so, so this is the thing that um, loads, so you see walk tree here. This is the part of cargo that loads the cargo configuration files from dot cargo slash config dot toml all the way up, up the tree from above where you run that cargo command. Um, and you see it's unmerged because it just returns a vector of every value it finds. Um, and in addition to that, there's, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, so there's load values from, there is load file, load includes, where did I end up adding this code? This was in include, aha, CLI args as table. So this is the part that parses the configuration options out of um, out of the config args, and you see here uh, this is the part that if the argument is a file name, then we load that file. Otherwise, we basically create uh, a single element toml document and return that instead. Um, 
And I, I have a feeling we're gonna have to return to this line. Uh, so this calls load file with this last argument being set to true, right? Because it's a config include rather than one that was just found in a, a normal walk through the stack. Uh, and so the question now is, what calls the CLI args? Merge CLI args. That's fine. That just um, merges. If you have multiple dash dash config, it merges, merges them together. So that's entirely reasonable. What calls that? Reload rooted at. Um, so that loads all the values from a given path. So this is what Cargo uses to, um, when it has decided where it's gonna run from, load all the config values, config files from dot cargo slash config from above where we are. Um, and in addition, merge all the CLI args to Cargo. Um, and this is the thing that allows you to set unstable Cargo flags in the Cargo config. Um, and so the question becomes, why the the config that gets set here, why does that get overridden by environment variables? And I think I know the answer to that. If I can find where um, that gets set from. Ooh, so it's like env. Yeah, so see here, this is the macro that's used to extract values. Get value typed. And um, you see it gets, so get CV grabs it from all the configuration that we've built up by reading things from disk or from config values from the, the arguments. And get env um, just returns that value from the environment if an environment variable by the appropriate name has been set. Uh, and so here we see if both are set, like if it's both set in the config and in the environment, then if the definition is higher priority than the environment, then it returns the value from the definition. Otherwise it uses the one from the environment. So the question is, was it this is higher, is higher priority thing? Let's see if we can find that. Okay, so let's see if we can dig that up. Is higher priority. So CLI is higher priority than environment. CLI is higher priority than path and environment is higher than path. Okay, so there's one bit missing here, which is uh, if it is a, if it's a, well, so, so what's tricky here is dash dash config with a file name, I believe gets recorded as a path. In fact, we can, we can figure that out if we go back to this file um, and we go to the line that we were at previously. See, I knew we were gonna get here. Um, so fn load file does here, right? CV from Tomal definition path. And you see it uses definition path, even though it was actually loaded from a command line parameter. Um, so really what we, and, and part of the complication here is this includes uh, argument. It's actually a little tricky. It's false if we're, you know, walking the tree the normal way. Um, it's true when you use dash dash config and then a file name, but it's also true for an experimental cargo feature that allows you to put include statements in cargo configuration files to basically embed another config in the, in the cargo config. Um, and for those, we wanted to inherit the definition that was already in place. Right, so it's not just as though this should be definition CLI if this was true. Um, I think what we actually want here is that load file here should set the definition as follows. 
if this is not an include, then use path, which is what it does today. If it is an include and it's from the CLI directly, um, then use CLI. If it's an include and it's not directly on the CLI, then use the definition of the context we're being parsed in. So this is where it gets tricky, right? So the way to think about this is if we're loading a path because of an include in another cargo configuration file, we should inherit its definition. Because if it was loaded from a dash dash config, then we should also be marked as being loaded from dash dash config. If it was from a path, then we should also be loaded from a, from a path. Um, now, I'm not gonna actually going to implement the fix for this right now. But what I'm going to do is instead uh, comment on this. Uh, <laughs> and you'd see Wei Hung is already, uh, Wei Hung is one of the cargo maintainers, uh, has already commented, uh, will eventually create a config file definition path, is the lowest priority of the three in comparison with the NVAR occurs here. Yep. Uh, so the NVAR always wins over the config. Uh, We may want to construct a config value with definition CLI here when load file is triggering is triggered by config CLI. The doing that loses the path information of definition path, regressing the error message. Right. So, so this is another good observation that, um, so the the definition parameter to a config is what Cargo uses to you know, if there's something weird about the configuration to tell the user where that configuration came from so they can go fix the problem. If we assign it as definition CLI, even though it was a file that was included, then the error message is going to say, you pass this on dash dash config. But that's not really what was happening. Um, pull request. Uh, definition CLI sum. Let's see. So this hasn't been reviewed yet. Let's go in ahead and see what change they made. Yeah, so it became an enum, right, instead of a bool. Um... And so load values unmerged went there. Uh, load unmerged include is file discovery. So I think this is actually wrong. And load values from uses and then let's see, load file, depending on why it was loaded, sets the appropriate definition. And load includes. Oh yeah, actually, no, maybe this is doing the right thing. So uh, load unmerged include calls. Hmm. Feels weird that this uses file discovery. Because I feel like it might not be. Like if we go down to the thing that loads, uh, where is our... Where is our, this one, CLI args this table. Load file, why load CLI? Oh yeah, load includes. So the way they dealt with this is the, um, the load includes takes a why load. And so if we're in the path, if we're in the regular file discovery loading, then we go through 
load includes when we path in, pass in file discovery. If we're in conf the dash dash config setting, we'll, we'll call load includes on any nested includes with um, CLI. And then it is going to load the file with that appropriate definition. And this is going to preserve the path even if it was loaded through CLI. Nice. And now uh, it's no longer going to be parsed as a path. It's going to be parsed as a CLI, which which fixes the behavior. But the path is still preserved for things like printing. Uh, nice. And now, you know, this is where the old definition path was being injected just always in load file. And now, depending on why it was loaded, uh, it'll generate the right thing. And then it's going to nestedly load includes using the same reason why it itself was loaded. So you get the recursive case. Um, Yeah. Right, so the, the tricky case here is when a, a dash dash config of a file ends up triggering an include of a file. Uh, and it, it looks like that's being treated correctly here. Um, you know, the one, one question here is, should Cargo warn you about this? Right, like in the, in the original issue here, of um, you know an environment variable, but also an explicit config flag. Which one should take precedence? Should it really be the dash dash config? Should that take precedence over environment variables? <sighs> it's hard to say. I I do think that in general, like explicit arguments are preferred over environment variables, right? Like think of something like um, you know think of something like make. So if you run nvcc equals, you know, gcc, make cc equals clang, install. What would you, which cc would you expect it to use? I think you would expect it to use clang. And I think it would use clang. Um, so, so I think the, the precedence here is pretty sensible. It does mean, so someone pointed out in comments that if you run cargo by pointing it at the exact same file as it would have used anyway, right? So if you do, you know, by default, cargo will look at uh, dot slash, uh, sorry, dot slash dot cargo slash config dot toml. So if you did, you know, cargo build dash dash config and passed in that path, then you're basically giving that file higher precedence in the hierarchy. But I think that's intended. Right, like you explicitly said, use this file. Um, so I, I think that's reasonable. I think the the documented behavior here is is right. Um, and you know, now that we've gone through all this work of figuring out that this actually did what we expected, um, let's go see whether we can just approve this. I don't have permission to merge CR merge PRs in, in Cargo, but we should take a look. Um, so this is checking that it's a test that creates two config files and an environment variable. And it says, if we set, yes, yeah, so you see this is the trick, right? Cargo underscore K is gonna set the same as K in the cargo config file. Um, if we run that, we would expect to get CLI one. So if you have multiple dash dash configs, the latter takes precedence and they both take precedence over the environment variable. Um, what's the difference between the first test and the second test? Oh, this one is also including a path and then that path takes precedence over all of the above because it comes last. And if you also give a key after the path, that takes precedence. Nice. Um, so, so you'll notice this first one is a test just of the 
config builder type that Cargo uses internally. And then this one is an actual integration test of, you know, Cargo proper, um, I believe. Actually, it's a good question. Yeah, this is using the config builder. This is also using the config builder. So what's the difference between these tests? Oh, this is a test for the include feature specifically. Um, so this is if we have a dot config, if we, if we have a config that sets an include. Um, then we want to make sure that the included file gets loaded at the right priority as well. That makes sense. Uh. Okay, so we only found one bug, I think, which is this, say, priority. Prove, uh, looks good to me. Do one typo in the test name. No. Prove. Nice. All right, so I think that means I can now mark this as done because I, I did did my work. All right, I can close these again. What are we back to now? Um, add error status enum and remove WebDriver error. Okay, so this is, we're jumping to a different crate again. This is why catching up on my GitHub notifications is often, um, I don't wanna say painful, but often takes me a while is because at this point, I have so many different repos that I have to bring in all the context for each one, not just because it's stream, but even for my own sake, I have to bring in the context or, or you know, repopulate my cache or something um, of why was this an issue? What, what were we talking about? What was my last round of review? So Fantachini is um, a Rust library for the WebDriver protocol that lets you control browsers uh, programmatically. And in particular, it aims to be a relatively low level library. It doesn't try to, you know, be, it doesn't have, try to have like ergonomic fluent ways to do things. It tries to map pretty directly onto the WebDriver client API. And then the idea is you would use a crate like, um, it's one called 34. Like I, I think it's literally called 34. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know what it's called 34, but uh, it's a WebDriver library for Rust and it, um, tries to be, you know, really nice. Like it tries to have an ergonomic interface. Um, and it's actually built on top of Fantachini. Um, it didn't used to not be, but but now it is. And the idea being that Fantachini provides like the underlying mechanisms, and then this just provides the ergonomic mappings on top. Um, and uh, this this person, Steve Pride, is the person who owns or, or maintains 34. And so we went a lot of back and forth on whether 34 should build on up of Fantachini, what changes should we make? And ultimately, um, you know, we, we managed to, to do some releases where it's now built on, on Fantachini. One of the problems that Fantachini has is that it uses the uh, web driver crate, which is published by Mozilla. And you know that's not a problem in and of itself, except that the WebDriver crate um, tends to get updated fairly regularly. Um, so you see, like every, in fact, I think it's quite literally every three months they cut a new release, and everyone is considered a breaking change. And that means that at least in theory, Fantachini would have to cut a breaking release every three months as well in order to upgrade its version of WebDriver. And the reason for this is because we have some of the WebDriver types and we can look at what those are, but basically the WebDriver um, crate provides, 
uh, that's a bad example, uh, command. It provides basically the, the protocol type definitions for the WebDriver protocol. It doesn't provide any of the, the mechanisms, um, but, but things like, you know, these are the parameters to a get named cookie request to the browser. And it happens to be the same crate that, um, uh, what's it called, M marionette? The, the Firefox web driver implementation. So that is the, the thing that receives these commands and applies them to Firefox. It uses this crate to understand the things that we send. So it's really nice to be able to just use something that we sort of know is correct because it's being used by the other side, at least for, for some browser. Um, but the problem is um, it, there, are a, there are some parts of Fantachini that actually exposes these types directly. Um, and one of the big ones is we expose web driver error. Uh, and the reason we do that is because, you know, sometimes we get an error back from the web driver server that we're interacting with that we don't understand. Like it doesn't have a nice semantics like, you know, uh, no such element or something. It's really just like an error code and a string. And in those cases, we we try to just return what it gave us. Um, in some cases, you know, there's an error status here that has a bunch of standard variants. And we try to just propagate those onwards so that we don't have to replicate this entire enum in our crate as well. Problem is, again, that means that part of our public API is part of the WebDriver crate. And whenever that's the case, it means that a breaking change to that crate would mean a breaking change to our crate in order to upgrade. And that's becoming a problem. We, we don't really want to have to do that because as you see, web drivers are already on version 46 and it's just gonna keep ticking up. It's not gonna stabilize. Um, and so what we've decided to do is after much back and forth is to inline all of the types that we use from web driver in our public API into our crate so that we control them. Uh, and that way remove web driver from our public API so that we're no longer tied to them for breaking changes. Um, and so that means copying over this error status um, enum that we just looked at, uh, remove the, the re-export that we had in our public API of that type. Um, and internally, we can keep using the, the web driver, but we need to map it to our internal um, variant. And there, there were a couple of other smaller fixes we made at the same time. Uh, as you see, you know, we essentially copied over error status. Uh, most of the comments are public documentation for WebDriver spec, which is the other reason why it would have been nice to not to have a copy of them over because sometimes there are updates to the documentation. It would be nice if we just got that automatically, but unfortunately not. Uh, do we need to remove the comments that are not in the spec? I'm not sure what the MPL license requirements are. Ooh. I think for MPL, you're allowed to reuse, but you have to mention the original project and its license. Um, and there was a couple of other things. So for Fantacini, we, we used to have our own error enum that, you know, lifted some of the web driver errors into nicer to access errors. Like no such element is so common. You want to access it. Um, but instead, so we have this command error type enum in Fantacini and we used to have one variant that was just this is a standard one that came from WebDriver. And you know, no such element is a standard error type, but we happen to just lift it into the upper enum to make it easier to access. Um, and with this change, we're actually gonna stick it back. Uh, we're, we're gonna remove the, the convenient access one and just have them all be under uh, standard. Uh, and it's a breaking change, which is okay. Um, in the case of Fantacini, um, we're already on, I think, I thought we were on an alpha. Yeah, I mean, we're going to have to do a breaking change anyway, but I, I'm okay with that because the hope here is that by doing this breaking change, we can stop doing breaking changes whenever WebDriver changes. Um, oh, it's 34 because the 34th element is Selenium, which is the name of the one of the primary, you know, originators of WebDriver. Uh, nice. Uh, okay, so where did I get last? I made a bunch of comments 21 days ago. That's not too bad. Uh, and... Right. So here, the challenge is, it used to be really nice if you tried to like click an element, 
then the error type that we returned just directly had a variant called no such element. Now it has a standard which internally contains an error whose kind is no such element, right? So, so now it's really annoying to detect whether the reason it erred was because the element didn't exist, um, which is what this comment is about. You know, like you would have to do this, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, and so the proposal is what if we have, you know, a, a helper methods that just uh, quickly check this for you without you having to do all this matches. Um, and it looks like I asked for that and they've added that. I don't know what these are. Okay. And that's fine. All right, let's go look at these changes. Files changed. I think there's a way for me to say changes from changes since your last review. So I'll get those first. And A to hide annotations. Uh, ooh, what's this? Right, our web driver error type is, oh, this is just a simplification we made to the constructor. Let me see if I can find that down here somewhere. New, yeah, so the error type we have can either hold a, a static string reference or an actual string, depending on whether you have a you know, relatively standard or a custom error message that you have to like dynamically construct. Uh, and the way you represent that is with the cow type, which can be you know either a reference or an owned value. Uh, and we just say that the, the lifetime of that reference has to be static if it is going to store a reference. Um, and you know that makes the API a little awkward because now you have to like either call into or specifically bring in the cow type and use the appropriate borrowed or, or owned variant. Um, and so the proposal I had was let's use impl into because both string references and capital S strings implement into cow static stir. Uh, and so this means that now we just stick the into into new and it means that any call to it, like the one that we saw up here, um, no longer has to use into. It'll just do the right thing. Um, no such element is now gone as a variant. It, it's, it comes through standard. What was is miss? What? A, why did I name it is miss? Weird. Uh, is detached shadow root. Um, I'm torn here. Like, you know, this seems maybe excessive. But I guess we might as well just have one for each. That seems fine. It'd be kind of nice if we could generate this with a macro, right? Like it, it, this is a lot of repeated code that's almost the same. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is actually, um, it'd be nice if we could turn all of these nearly identical definitions into a macro, something like um, let's see if I can cook up one of these on the fly. Um, is helper. Um, and it's going to take a, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a little bit and then I'm going to explain the syntax. Um, So 
it's gonna be name actually we're gonna do something like this maybe or maybe that can be it can't be a type it can't be a path it might be an ident actually um, and then we're gonna do so this is what we want to generate so here's what this macro is gonna generate it's gonna for each element so the syntax here for the argument list is uh, the the outermost bracket doesn't matter. It's just a it's just required for the syntax. Uh, the next one is when you call this macro, I expect there to be a literal curly bracket to start. This next uh, ooh, this next uh, dollar parenthesis is saying this is a group, and you see it it ends with comma star, which is saying this is a group of multiple elements, uh, zero or more, that are separated by comma. That's what that syntax means. So star is zero or more, comma is separated by comma. Um, and I don't think I actually want that in one. Um, and the things that there can be zero or more of are uh, Ident, so ident is any identifier. Um, this can be things like variable names, function names, type names. Um, so it has to be some identifier followed by, you know, arrow, fat arrow followed by some other identifier. And the, the syntax here is dollar, then name of the meta variable. So the thing that you're gonna use as the, the substitution in the, uh, what's this called? The transcriber. Um, so in this case, the first one I'm going to call variant. It's going to be mapped to variant. The other one's going to be mapped to name. Uh, and then what I wanted, the code I want to generate, why can't I, there we go. That's what I want. Uh, and then what I want here is actually uh, this should be name. This should be variant. And so someone asked the, the very important question here about can macros generate doc comments? And the answer is it's complicated, but yes. Um, but they can only do it in a very particular way, which is, um, I wonder if this will work. And you're gonna hate me for this. I think it has to be like this. And then, so here's a secret you may not know about Rust, which is that um, triple comments are actually attributes. And they're attributes that read doc equals, right, Rust. Uh, reference. Let me check that I'm not lying to you. Um, where is my comments? Doc comments. Uh, line doc comments begin with exactly three slashes are interpreted as special syntax for doc attributes. That is, they are equivalent to writing doc equals and then a string. Uh, and so here's what you can do. You can say doc equals dollar variant. And I think it's like stringify. I think it's that. I mean, okay, maybe maybe I should actually do this somewhere else to see that I'm not completely lying to you. Um, do I have a temp in here? Great. 
Cargo new, expand. Expand, CD expand. Uh, and it's gonna yell at me somewhere. Who knows why yet? Uh, expected one of, right, so it's, this is for the repetition and I need to say star again. Uh, and here it's complaining because that has to be a semicolon. That has to be a semicolon. Where's the semicolon have to be? Um, and then if I now say, you know, enum error status, or I guess I'll have to do, you know, enum command error. And it's just gonna have a standard, which is gonna be an error status. Uh, an enum error status is gonna be foo and bar. And then what I would like to be able to do, right, is I would like to be able to do um, impl command error. And I wanna do like uh, is helper. And in fact, in fact, I'm gonna remove this extra one because it's not technically needed because you can use any type of bracket for invoking a, a macro. And I'm gonna say, you know, is foo, or sorry, uh, foo is gonna map to is foo. Bar is gonna map to is bar. That's what I would like to happen. Uh, and I think it doesn't allow trailing commas. That's fine. Uh, we can do that by just saying uh, uh, question mark is zero or one. So I'm saying zero or one comma at the end. Uh, and so we're actually going to do this. Errors, error status. And it's still mad at me. It's gonna it's gonna um, auto format once I fix whatever it's complaining about here. Is it a tuple or struct variant? Is it a struct or tuple? Uh fine. Uh stand this, uh, this is like a web driver error. And so there's a struct web driver. The only reason I'm typing these out is I want to make sure that I can just copy paste the macro at the end and it'll, it'll generate the appropriate uh, setup. Um, equals cannot be pad for error status. That's fine. This is going to derive uh, partial eek and eek and remove the semicolon. Consider removing this semicolon. Uh, and it's gonna generate pub, that's fine. We're gonna just make all of these be pub so that it doesn't yell at me. Unmapped, unmatched end of that. Where did I mess up? Somewhere. Not quite sure why it's complaining about this. So if I now run cargo expand, let's see what it generates. This feels like it generated correctly. Okay, so I don't, it's just the uh, Rust analyzer being confused. But you see, this is the expansion of our macro. So that worked. Now one question is gonna be, does this actually you know, generate the right thing. Um, right, because I'm not sure whether when we parse this markdown, it's gonna end up adding like white space or something. So if I run cargo doc, no depths, uh, dash dash open, nice. So if I go to command error, 
Yes, yeah, so you see it it adds a it adds a white space here. Which means that the link isn't going to be valid. It adds a white space before and after. Mm. Yeah, so I think we can do concat I think we can do this. And in fact, uh, yeah, technically we can do this. It's nice to keep it relatively self-contained. Um, I have to put the, the dot in there because otherwise um, the next line is gonna be, this is gonna be a space before the period. But now if I do this, what do we get? Command error. And that links appropriately to the right variant. Nice. So that means this macro is, to borrow a, a great term, uh, the shit. So let's go ahead and do this and then do You can then replace all of the methods with something like this. Preview. Nice. Uh, start a review. Yeah, so this is a, a, a good example of the kind of things that I really like macros for. It's just like, it, it makes anything that looks really like a repeated pattern, it can make it so much more concise, right? Like reading this, this is much nicer. Um, okay, and then these we can all move past. Seems fine. Yeah, so this is a, a thing I, I asked for, which is um, for all of these error status variants, there's a, in the standard, there's like a string description for each one that you're supposed to include whenever you trigger it. And because it's statically known, it's, it's just good practice to actually return it as a static string because who knows, it might be useful to, to someone. When you implement error, you get to define a description, right? And usually that's through the display trait. The problem with display is it doesn't give you a static string. Or rather, it's not a problem. There's error description used to require this and it was really annoying. Um, but so here what we're doing is we have a description that someone can use to get the static string if they really want to. Um, and then display just writes out that description. So we implement display, but if you really want the static string, you have a way to do it. Um, and that way, when we serialize, we don't have to convert it into a string and then serialize the string. We can serialize the static string instead and, and save an allocation. Um, and this into cal we already talked about. Uh, it seems fine. This now becomes nicer because it can just use the helper. This becomes nicer because it can use the helper, it can use the helper, it can use the helper. I'm guessing there are a bunch more of these. And these have just check annotations. So the one thing I'm curious here then is, was there anything else? One thing that, that annoys me a little bit about GitHub's um, UI is that, like I kind of want to see the diff like from including this one. And I also don't want these to be resolved because I want to check that I have resolved them, not just they have resolved them. Um, so for example, I asked to derive hash and eek. And I'm guessing that's done in this commit. Um, doo -doo -doo. Right, so this removes the 
the sort of hoisted variants and stick, just leave some in standard. Um, that's fine. That goes away in the next commit like we saw. Um, this is an internal converter that turns a... Actually, this shouldn't be necessary anymore now because I guess it just wraps the it's a standard. That's fine. Um, those are no longer hoisted. This now derives eek and hash, which is fine because error status, you know, who knows where people might want to stick them. They can't be ordered in a meaningful sense, but by having them implement eek and hash, you could, for example, store them in a hash set. Uh, it might be useful. So that one is indeed resolved. This is... It's weird that it's called an error code, but returns a string. Um, and it is indeed, that's now been turned into description like we saw and an implementation of display. So that one is indeed solved. Um, yeah, so this was another one. Um, it used to be that there was an implementation of from the error status type in the WebDriver crate for our implementation, our you know copied um, version of error status, and that's not okay because that this impl is a part of the public API. So someone could, in theory, be you know taking a dependency of Fantacini and a de dependency on WebDriver, and relying on this from implementation working for the particular major version of WebDriver that they are using, which would break if Fantacini ever upgraded its version of WebDriver because the from trait would be implemented from a different version of the error status type. Um, so I think ultimately that was removed, I hope. Uh, yep, that was taken out. That's great. What else do we got here? Uh, this is the ability to parse an error status from a string. So it's sort of the, it's the inverse of turning it to a string. Uh, and I just said that should be basically a parse. You know, there's an argument for it's a little annoying that we have to define. We basically keep the need to keep these strings in two places. It means they have to be kept in sync. Um, it'd be nice if we didn't have to do that. Um, there are macros that let you do this sort of two-way conversion. Uh, we could write a trivial macro to do it ourselves, right? To to generate both the description and the parse in one go. Um, so actually, let me, I think that's what I want to do. I think I want to go here, look at the files changed. Um, look at, this is in source error. And over here, get rid of the annotations. I said get rid of the annotations. There we go. Um, but here too, it might be nice to not have these string literals, uh, written out to in two places in the code, uh, here and in fromster. Um, may be worth turning them into um, may be worth turning them into constants or writing a little helper macro to generate both this method and the from and the impl fromster at the same time. Uh, great. What's this one? Uh, the message. Okay, so where does that come from? So try, the difference between try from and from is that try from can fail. Um, it can like return an error if the conversion didn't succeed. Um, this gets to now store static. That's nice. Uh, if the thing is static. Uh, this was an unrelated thing that got resolved without a change. And 
There's a test somewhere further down here. That now checks no such element, no such alert. Yeah, these we all looked at. And this one is a stale element reference. So I think this just used to be wrong. Interesting. Okay. Um, so at that point, I think what I want to do is actually... So these all look like they've resolved. So I'm torn here because, you know, neither of these are really blockers. Uh, I've left two comments that are more suggestions for... Uh, improving the niceness of the code, um, but I wouldn't consider either a blocker. Uh, if you want me to merge this as is, um, I'm happy to do that as well. Looks great now. Positivity. Always inject some of that. People are helping with your software. Uh, great. Submit review. Done. Okay. Well, we've got we've gotten through a whole three things. Uh, okay. Uh, native Sassel support. Um, okay, so this is for a different crate entirely. This is for the IMAP crate. Uh, this is why I need to give away ownership of some of these crates soon. Mm. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so this is for the IMAP crate and it's specifically the IMAP protocol has multiple ways you can authenticate with a server. The most obvious one being, you know, you, you give a username and password. Um, but there are other ways to do it. And there's in fact a, a, protocol authentication standard for how you can have different authentication schemes. Um, and that's known as SASL. And I forget what SASL stands for. It's like something, SASL. Simple authentication and security layer. Sorry for the bright screen. Um, and the way that the IMAP crate has traditionally done this is it has an authenticator trait. So if we go look at, um, the yeah, IMAP crate, which has an alpha and has been has an alpha for for 3.0 for a while now, um, partially because of things like this. Like I, I want to land that because it's worth using. Um, so the authentic the authenticator trait, um, all it really requires that you implement is a process method that takes a challenge from the server and it returns a response that can be written back to the server as bytes. Um, so it's, it's very straightforward, but Authenticate wasn't really written to specifically work with, you know, SASL. Like it doesn't, it's a very manual thing to have to implement, right? Bytes to bytes. Um, the current Authenticator system, most of SASL can be implemented. There are a few advantages to using an external crate. So the idea here, I assume, is that there's a, uh, there's a crate that specifically does SASL through, I guess, a library that does it for you um, that supports, you know, whatever, multiple different authentication standards. Um, rather than requiring people to implement this authenticate trait themselves, which, you know, can be really complicated for some of these authentic authentication standards. They're not always trivial to implement internally. Um, 
Feature like SASL security layers and channel bindings aren't really doable with the current approach. I don't know what a channel binding is. Sorry again for bright screen. I don't think you can turn the RFCs dark. Um, interesting. Oh, I see. So here the idea is that you can have the TLS session be the thing that authenticates you. And so that way you don't actually have to do any authenticate, but you do need to tell the server that you wanted to do that. Um, interesting. Let's see what the diff they propose. So basically what this PR is asking is like, hey, I want to make a change that's sort of like this. Um, would you be okay with this kind of a change? Basically tying IMAP to this particular SASL crate um, rather than you know the current authenticator API. So the first problem of course is that this is a Git dependency, which we can't have if we're going to publish to crates.io. Um, which is fine. Like I'm, I'm guessing that's just because they're they're doing development, and so they wanted something easy to bind to. Um, so this allows you to create a SASL config, right? So you create a client builder. You construct a SASL config with whatever stuff, and you call client authenticate, and you give in a SASL config and a mechanism. Yeah, so instead of calling dot login, so if you look back at um, at the API, um, IMAP has a client and a session. So a client is just you're connected to an IMAP server, and in general, uh, you're going to call login in order to turn that just connection into an authenticated session that lets you access email. Um, so you see, it returns a session if the login is successful or you can authenticate using an authenticator. Uh, and here the proposal is that authenticate, instead of taking in this, or, you know, our own type here, um, it takes a SASL config. My first thinking here is these don't have to be mutually exclusive, right? One option here is that we could have a, a dot SASL that takes a SASL config if you want to authenticate with SASL. But if you don't, if you just want a relatively simple challenge uh, challenge response scheme, for example, or for testing, actually, this might come in super useful, uh, you can use an authenticator instead. And once you authenticate, you have a session and then everything works the way it usually did. Um, so let's see, it removes authenticator, which is really just the definition of the trait, I think. Um, it now brings in our SASL. And of course, we would want to bring this in under a, under a feature. So authenticate now takes a Sassel config, why an arc Sassel config? And what's Sassel client here? That seems weird. I don't know why this requires that it takes an arc. Um, interesting. Yep, so it passes the mechanism here. Then it does an auth handshake using the SASL session where previously we were like manually parsing the um, the basically the binary data that comes from the server, you know, turning it into bytes by base64 decoding, sending it through the authenticate trait that we were provided, and then base64 encoding the response back to the server. And this has to do the same thing, like it still has to do the decode. But when it has done the decode, uh, where does parse, parse authenticate response, where does that come from? Oh, I see that, that already exists. So that's mostly the base64 decode. So what does it turn things into after it does the decode? When it has the data, it'll do authenticator step 64. Yeah, so I think this is, you know, you give it, 
you, you run the next step of the authentication process. Then there might be multiple. Um, and so here we're going to step 64 with the challenge that we just decoded, uh, allow it to write back to the output, and then write the output back as, as U64. And once we're done, we tell Sassel that, okay, there's no more data come from the server, just you know finish authentication. Hmm. So overall, this this looks pretty reasonable to me. I I think the okay. Let's let's do this. Um, let's see. Useful thing to add, uh, though I'd want to add it behind a feature flag. I also think we could do it in an additive way. That is, keep the current authenticate based a authenticate based API. Um, and then provide a SASL authenticate method uh, called, say, what do we call SASL login? Uh, Sassel auth, maybe. Um, the Sassel feature is enabled. That does auth through Sassel. Uh, authenticate may still be useful on its own um, uh, for users who are working with relatively simple or experimental APIs, um, uh, mechanisms uh, such as during testing. Um, one thing that surprised me when uh, glancing over the changes was the need for arc wrapping the config. Uh, can that be avoided? Why is that required by the Sasso client API? Right, comment, done. Uh, what we got next? Oh yeah, note about the Git dependency. Good one. Um, oh, also we'd want to make sure by the time this lands uh, that we can take a regular crates.io dependency on our Sazzle rather than a git dependency so that we can in turn publish, continue to publish IMAP on Grace.io. Uh, add interactive mode. Okay, so this is a PR to a different project, which is Rogit, um, which we used for, uh, this is our Wordle solver um, and Someone submitted a PR that adds an interactive mode. And by interactive here, uh, I don't mean playing the game. I mean, helping you play a game. The idea here being you're on wordle.com and it's asking you, what's your guess? You can run Roget in interactive mode. It'll tell you what you should guess. 
and you have to type back in what the real Wordle told you the correct and wrong uh, answers were. Like basically, which ones are gray, which ones are green, which ones are yellow. Put that in and it'll tell you what thing to guess next. Basically, how can you use Rajat as a Wordle cheater, uh, if you will. Um, and there's a surprising amount of, you know, back and forth here trying to figure out wh where's the right place to land this? Like, how should we change the API to enable this kind of interactive mode? Um, ultimately, I think we got pretty far. Um, uh, let's see. So the ask I had was... Right, so one challenge here is, you know, the, the UI is pretty minimal here. Um, and it's complicated because, you know, it, it gives you a five letter word and ideally you want, and this is what the, the person's saying in the response here, when you input your, your the, the correctness of your guess that you get from Wordle, you kind of want your response to align up with the output from the program that told you what letters to guess, just so it's easier to like visually match the two. What I was saying in my comment was, it's not obvious that you should use like C for correct, M for misplaced, and W for wrong, right? That, that's not clear from, you know, if it just says colors, which is what the prompt is here. Um, it, it is true though that it's nice if, if, if they line up, but they wouldn't if the prompt is this long. I think one option here is to have the this prompt appear further up. Um, uh, that's a good point. Um, what if we print out these instructions further up in the output? Uh, uh, print out these instructions just once further up in the output, like before we even print the first word to guess. Maybe we can have longer uh, description of a longer description of the expected input without breaking the alignment. Um, also, colors is a little weird here, given that we take CMW as input, not G G, Y, not green, yellow, gray. Um, oh, these were just some minor suggestions to the error output. Oh yeah, so this is a fun little change. Let me see if I can see that in context. Um, here maybe, line 155. So they had this, this is a really useful thing to know about. Oh, how can I see this before they force pushed? Mm. Here, maybe. So they had this um, loop up here where they're walking all the over all the characters of a string. They're ma trying to map each character to the appropriate like enum variant. So they're basically parsing the string one character at a time. And if, if any of the characters is the wrong character or rather one that we don't have a mapping for, they produce an error. Then they collect all of those into a vector and then they look whether any of the things in the vector is an error. And if the thing, then, then, then they uh, get the thing at that location in the vector and they question mark it to turn, to propagate any errors, um, right? So this is basically, you know, find the first thing that is an error, get it and question mark early returns, which is why this is unreachable to propagate that error. Uh, and then because they've done this, they now iterate through all of the things that are parsed 
map them to unwrap because they know they're all okay because there's nothing here. And then they collect it into a vector again. And then they try to turn it into a five length array. So it's a really like convoluted way of saying, I want to just error if there's something bad, um, if there's something that's not an appropriate character. And um, this is where it comes in really handy that you actually have the ability in Rust to collect into a result of a vector, which made that whole code makes it a lot simpler because now you can just do the same thing we did, right? So match and produce the appropriate okay or error, collect into a result vec, which has the semantics of keep collecting into a vec or keep collecting into an okay vec rather. Um, but if you get an error from the iterator, then it, you know get rid of the whole okay vec and instead just return that error and then we can question mark that and that gives us back just the vector and propagates an error and then we try into to turn it into an array so it just it just makes it a lot more concise um, so that was so this has been fixed this has been fixed that was my comment here uh, which they've done and then what are these diffs? These are probably just rebases. I think this is all just force push. Yeah, rebase on top of main. Um, let's go look at the changes. So I left the one comment here that was just, you know, about the prompt. Um, These conflict with each other. That seems fine. If interactive, the play interactive. Play interactive takes a guesser. Oh, they, they've added that. Nice. Ah, you already added. Uh, instructions at the top. Nice. Um, what is the actual, so this is a coverage failure. I feel like I've probably broken coverage. So that seems like just a separate problem. All the others are fine. Um, I still think colors is a little weird, but let's not block on that. Start a review, finish review, approve. And merge. Thanks for sticking with this. Excellent. Done. Update dependencies. A hash and quick XML. Uh, so this is in a different crate again. This is in Inferno, which is our port of um, flame graph to Rust um, that updates some dependencies, in particular a hash and quick XML. And I, I asked them to also update Criterion. Um, <laughs> yeah, so for Inferno, we bring in a bunch of test cases from the flame graph Perl implementation, which means that we have a git submodule that holds all the, the data files for that. And so if you don't do git submodules update dash dash in it, uh, then you don't, git doesn't download the submodule for you. And so the tests are going to fail. Should arguably add a build script or something to make that nicer. Um, all right, so let's go look at the diff here. Uh, cargo lock, that's fine. Cargo toml. 
That seems fine. So that's been viewed. Let's just mark that as viewed too. Uh, that looks like a clippy lint. That's fine. Uh, this is a quick XML change of now it just has a new instead of owned name and borrowed. It's interesting. So if we go to quick XML and we look for new. So what was this byte start? Yeah, so it's now an into cow. So that that's the reason you don't need to separate borrowed and owned anymore. So that seems pretty reasonable. And that's probably gonna change a bunch of things in the internals here. No longer lead from plain string. That seems fine. It's all fine. Deckle. Oh, nice. So we don't have to raw print these. This is now uh, an XML declaration. Version of one standalone. No. It's a doc type where we just keep the same doc type as before, that's fine. Write SVG, this is more things with attributes. That's fine. So change to new, change to new. I wonder why this is from content. Oh, this is um, because this has attributes as well. And so from content also parses the attributes. So let's go back and check that I didn't mess up this anywhere else. These are all just attribute, these are all just um, tag names, so they don't need from content. Same here, same here. Even, even if they did, one of the tests would fail. So that seems reasonable. Um, okay. This is Byte start, new stop with attributes. This iterator has just been rewrapped a little bit. Otherwise it looks fine. Same with stop, same with this. This looks fine, looks fine. Oh, hey, a bot that I can ban. Block user. Nice. Love spam. Um, from escaped, from escaped, from escaped. Yeah, so these all look like pretty straightforward API changes. New, new, that's all fine. Uh, oh, this is also a clippy lint of if your pattern is a single character, then use a character instead of a string. That's fine. And then this is all changes to the, the expected test output. I don't actually know what this is gonna render. Really? It's not gonna let me look at the rich diff. That's fine. Yeah, these are all just SVG changes to the tests, uh, which seems fine. And there are no more than that. Great. And so the next question is, is Criterion, Ahash, or Quick XML in our public API? I'm pretty sure they're not. Um, also, it wouldn't really matter if we had to do a breaking change for Inferno, but uh, it matters a little bit. Um, collapse has the collapse trait, which does not have any Quick XML in it. Um, and these just implements collapse. That's all fine. All of these are just options. Um, so these aren't going to have anything in them. Differential from files just takes options. From readers takes options. Nothing in here. Flame graph has from files. These are just going to be simple. This is an enum. This is an enum. Options has lots of fields, but none of them are from a hash or quick XML. Same with this. 
default. There are uh, crates that help you do this. So there's a um, public, the cargo public API command and the Semver check API um, or command. Both of these help you do this. Um, in this case, I'm pretty sure there's nothing like, you know, it would be weird for us to expose um, like a hash or quick XML in our public API. We do expose RGB, but that's fine. Um, color, multi palette, basic palette. Yeah, all of this is very, very non public. Nice. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Approve. Well, here's a problem. I can't, I can't scroll down enough. There we go. Approve. Um, great. To prove and run. Hopefully that those tests are going to pass. While we wait for that, I'm going to take a bio break. All right, I'm back. Uh, let's see. Why are these still, some of them are failing. Seems unfortunate. Uh, this is cargo format complaints. This is feature may not be used on the stable release channel in the Itoa crate. Oh, interesting. This means, oh, this is from the minimal versions. <sighs> okay, so let's talk about minimal versions a little bit. Um, one challenge here is um, I run one, um, test step in most of my CI that puts all of my dependencies at the lowest version, the lowest version within the SEMR range that's allowed by my dependency closure. Um, the idea here being that, you know, if I did require some newer feature, I want to make sure that that's declared in my cargo toml. And the reason I want to do that is the failure mode is kind of weird. If someone has, imagine someone built my project ages ago. And so they have a lock file from that build. Then they do a git pull and then they try to build. If my minimum dependencies aren't declared correctly, then they're gonna get a really bizarre build failure because they're using an old version of a dependency that my project doesn't work with anymore. But I haven't upped the dependency and so therefore I, they don't get to know. Um, so that's why it's, it's just nice to do that check. It's not really a requirement, but it's nice. Um, now, 
what this is running into is uh, I guess the by updating some of these dependencies, probably quick XML, um, we also got a new version of ITOA and the update to minimal version step that I do is going to upgrade to the lowest version of ITOA within the Semver range, which is going to be version 0.4.0. Now, of course, the build that we do runs with some particular version of Rust, and it runs with a relatively recent version of Rust. When ITOA 04 came out, or was building, uh, I guess it was using a feature? It was using a nightly feature when a particular feature was enabled, which is a little weird already. But it has since been stabilized on newer versions of Rust. So what this is complaining is, first of all, feature may no, no longer be used on the stable release channel, but also that feature has been stabilized, so you can use it on stable now. Um, there's not a great way to solve this particular problem, right? Because the ITOA dependency comes into us, um, actually, it might come in directly. Let's go see if that's true. Uh, cargo Tommel. We have a dependency on ITOA 1. Where is ITOA 04 even coming from? That's also interesting. That's real curious. Uh, I'm going to guess... I have no idea why any of these would make it so that we get in uh, such a low version of ITOA. Okay, here's what I'm going to say. Uh, for the... There was something else. There was a failure down here, too. Trade bounds other than size on const fn parameters are unstable. This is with quick XML 025. That's interesting. So what is quick so for quick XML, what's its actual version? This is the thing that crates.io has started doing for me, which is very annoying. Which is if I try to go directly to a crate, it'll just load forever unless I delete my cookies for that page. Um Huh, Greek smells 025. Because this is just a build error in Quick XML. On line 64 of Source Writer. That's interesting. Source Writer. Line 62. Const of, yeah, here. This commit. Drop const of n, because it basically requires to use a particularly new version of Rust. Yeah, and you see it actually fails on Rust 159. And so this is another CI step that I run, which is I try to make sure that the crate continues to build with a somewhat older version of Rust. There's a lot of debate in the Rust community about you know which versions should you support? Should you even bother trying to support old versions of Rust? Um, I, I like to do it at least on a you know best effort basis. Uh, and so this is basically saying it fails to build on 159 and it fails to build because Quick XML basically in, in their zero, I guess 0 0.24 release added um, a const fn for a generic function, which doesn't work on Rust 159, apparently it only works on newer versions. I'm guessing this PR will have more information. It does not, uh, but it does add a CI test now to, to see that they don't regress on this. And I'm guessing there's been no release of this. Let's see. Uh... Right, as though there's no actual release for this yet. Uh, so let's go ahead and say, so what we're gonna do here is, um, 
Looks like we have a couple of CI failures. The minimal versions one seems to be because we somehow now pull in ITOA 0 0.4.0, which is super old. Um, not sure why. If you run cargo update C minimal versions and then cargo tree I ITOA 0 0.4.0, um, you may get some pointers to what's happened. That said, this uh, I'm fine merging even if that one is red. It could be that uh, rebasing, that merging from main will fix the problem for you. Um, the MSRV CI step uh, 1.159.0 is because of, let me link the actual issue. I guess maybe there isn't an issue. Um, uh, is because of a MSVR regression in quick XML. It's been fixed upstream, but there hasn't been a release yet. Um, I'd actually like to hold off on merging this PR until that lands. Um, at which point we should bump the quick XML dependency to 0 0.25.1. Uh, and then the check stable format CI step seems to complain about a the lack of cargo format being applied to a line we changed should be an easy fix. Comment. Great. All right. Uh, I think with that, I can now mark this as done. And I think with that, we're let's do one more. Let's we'll do this as the last one. Um, because this was a longer discussion. Basically, um, one of our dependencies for this is for a different crate. Every single one we've looked at has been a different crate. This is for the open SSH crate, which gives you a sort of programmatic API for doing SSH operations and SSHing to machines and running commands there. Um, and we have a dependency on a crate called open SSH mux client, which is instead of interacting with SSH through the, or open SSH through the SSH command, um, we actually directly implement the protocol that the SSH command uses when talking to a, um, an SSH command master control daemon um, that you can set up to, to reuse SSH connections. Um, we do that through the OpenSSH mux client crate. The problem we have, uh, and as I pointed out in here, um, we actually expose, and this is related to what we did with Fantacini, we have one particular error variant in our crate um, that over here that you can see. So we have a we have an error type in the OpenSSH crate, which is public, and one of its variants is an OpenSSH mux client error that you can sort of propagate up. Um, and this one, you know, means that the OpenSSH mux client error type is in our public API, which means that if there's a breaking change to this crate, we have to do a breaking change to our crate. And in this case, this is a breaking change to that crate. So if we did take this upgrade from Dependabot, we would have to do a new uh, major version of OpenSSH as well. 
Um, and I think the, the maintainer of OpenSSH, Mux Client, who is also a contributor to OpenSSH, didn't realize that this was the case. And so sort of did this breaking change without quite uh, realizing the implications. Um, and so, yeah, so this is one of the tools, Semmer checks, that, that tries to detect whether something is a breaking change. And in this case, I guess just it missed the fact that this wasn't a breaking change. Uh, and so things got sad. Um, so ultimately, they released... It turned out that this particular change that they made was actually not a breaking change to OpenSSH Mux client. So they released a new minor version of that rather than the new major version, which we then just bring in automatically. Um, due to the release of SSH format 013, the next release might have to be 016.1, which would be a breaking change. Uh, they're going to try to group together a bunch of different breaking changes once. That's a good idea. Uh... Okay, remove all the error types into separate crates then mark them as non-exhaustive. Will this fix the problem? That's interesting. So the proposal here is if we made the error types of OpenSSH Mux client be in a separate crate, so a crate called like OpenSSH Mux client errors, I guess, um, then, and we make the error enum variant or the error enum in that crate be non-exhaustive so that we can add new variants to it over time without it being them without adding the variants being a breaking change then our crate could take a dependency on that crate and now the openssh mux client crate could keep doing breaking changes and it's no longer part of our public api uh and there wouldn't be breaking changes to the error crate, and therefore we wouldn't need to do breaking change. So that's an interesting proposal. The, um, it's a little weird to have a crate just for your errors. But, but I also sort of understand the attraction. Um, I, we basically have... We have four options here. One is to do this, have a separate crate. Uh, the other is to try to remove the crate entirely from our public API, which would mean basically not exposing those errors. Like basically you could imagine, you know, that we could turn them into a, um, you know, a string or something. There's a variant of that. So the, the third option we have is to expose that error as a, like a box didn't error. Uh, which would mean that we're no longer tied to it and people would, consumers of the OpenSSH crate would have to like downcast them into the appropriate OpenSSH mux client error type. Uh, and that would work. Like it would, it would mean that it's not technically a breaking change for us to bump OpenSSH mux client. But at the same time, it would break our users nonetheless because the downcast would start failing for them if there was a breaking change, because the downcast would be to a, a different type because it would be a different version of that type. Um, and then the last uh, potential solution here is um, we could inline the error type, basically keep a copy of that error type in our crate, and then you know basically do the same thing as we did for Fantachini with WebDriver, it's not very attractive here, um, especially because, you know, uh, uh, it means we have to keep up to date with the changes to that error type. And I don't love the idea of having to keep a separate copy. I, I actually think I kind of like the, you know, keep errors in a separate crate proposal here. Um, it's a little more cumbersome for the people who maintain that crate, but not really for us. I guess if they're in a workspace, it's not that bad. Um, yeah. It's a bit more um, inconvenient for you in maintaining 
OpenSSH mux client, um, but it would solve the problem as long as, um, but it would solve the problem as long as uh, you don't have to make breaking changes to that error crate. Uh, keep in mind though, and this is an interesting point, keep in mind though that um, if the error, if the errors in that crate internally contain errors from somewhere else, like another crate such as SSH format, uh, and the error crate needs to update its dependency on SSH format to propagate new errors, then that would still be a breaking change unless um, the new version of SSH format's errors go into a new variant and both uh, the old and new versions stay around as dependencies. I don't know what kind of dependencies you're taking in your errors though. Um, may not be a problem in practice. It would certainly reduce the likelihood that breaking changes in OpenSSH mux client would require a breaking change in OpenSSH. Um, another option here is to type erase the errors and store them as boxed in error plus uh, send plus sync plus static. Those extra bounds is because we want them to be send and sync. In general, you want your errors to be, and you want them to be static so that they support downcasting. Um, type raise the errors and store them as that, um, which would technically allow us to get away with not doing a major version bump for OpenSSH when OpenSSH mux client does one, although in practice it could still cause problems for user for OpenSSH users who rely on downcasting. Although how many of those are there really cause hard to debug problems. Comet. Um, oh yeah, someone made the, the point in chat, and this isn't about this specifically, but um, in general, try to keep your PRs somewhat targeted because it makes it a lot easier to maintain. Otherwise you end up with like, can you fix this thing and also this thing and also this thing? That There's a lot more churn in the PR. I would rather have many small PRs that I can land independently. Um, someone made the point in chat here that this is an, they write, uh, this is an odd symptom of the weirdness of Rust's error handling story. All the options are kind of unsatisfactory. And I, I don't know whether it's about Rust, right? Like I think this is more about the implications of semantic versioning, right? Like, if the, if the only toggle you have is either the whole crate had a breaking change or the, cha or the change is entirely backwards compatible, you can't do things like, you know, individually version your types. If you could, then this problem would sort of go away. Um, but in reality, what's happening is here, this is more about strict typing, right? Where if you really looked at the types, they did change, right? Like this is a different type. Um, and if you want 
the compiler to do type checking for you, you wanted to warn you about these kinds of things at compile time because if the type is different, the semantics may have differed uh, or different fields might be available. So like, I, I don't buy that this is like an unnecessary problem. I think it's just a hard problem. Uh, and one way you can get away with it is sort of, you can you can do duck typing here, right? Of saying, um, which is basically what the, the box din solution does of saying, all we're gonna store here is this is some kind of error and not the concrete type. And then you give access to things like, you know, it can, you can print it. Um, the, the way you get at this with things like, you know, in Ruby, for example, you can throw an exception and, you know, there aren't really sim different um, versions of a dependency. If something has roughly the same shape, users are going to keep being able to use it as, as long as they only access fields that exist in both the old and the new version of that shape. Um, it doesn't matter that the type is actually the same. But, but in Rust, that's not true because we have strict typing. Uh, and the, the error context API might actually help a little bit here because it makes it more defensible to use something like a boxed in error. The context API uh, is basically, you know, a way to say on this type, give me a field that has of the type U64, right? Or of the type, I don't know, you know, the, of the type, some type. And you can't use strings with it, I don't think. You can't use like keys. It's only by type. Um, but that would mean that it might not matter whether you can downcast the error into a specific known concrete error type, but rather, can I access this kind of context through that error? Um, and so that means basically you're, the users of your library are less likely to rely on, can I downcast this into this version of this concrete error type? And more likely to just rely on, does the, the opaque error that you gave me, does it have these properties that I care about? Um, but it's still not perfect. It's it's definitely not. Um, yeah. So so you have the um, uh, the Semver hack for this, where instead of having a separate crate for error, um, you have the new the old version of the crate take a dependency on the new version of the crate and re-export its error type, and that way the the types are actually from the same version, and things just continue working. Um, it would have the same property here. Um, I don't know if it's better, right? B to keep it in a separate crate. I guess we could, we could, um, December hack, December trick is what it's called. Oops. That's not what I meant. Um, you could also use the Sember trick uh, specifically for your error type when you do a new major release and it have the same effect as um, as having a separate error crate although it makes it harder for uh, users to realize that they can rely on the backwards compatibility of the error type and only the error type uh, uh, across major versions. Versions. Uh, great. Done. All right. I think we're going to stop there. We got through one page and there's another page, but it's getting late and I need dinner. Um, but thanks for joining. I'll, I'll see when I do another one of these, you know, my notifications keep piling up. I have two new notifications since we started the stream. So like there, there's always more work of this and who knows the next one will probably be impromptu as well. Um, hopefully that was useful. We went through so many different repositories. Um, but thank you all, uh, have a great rest of your day or night, depending on where you are and I'll, I'll see you some other time. <laughs>